Hi, everyone. We'll um, go ahead and get started. It's two o'clock. Thank you for joining us today for our uh, webinar on invasive species. Um, we are presenting today Invasive Alternatives, Winning the Battle Against Invasive Plants in Your Garden. Uh, this is um, Invasive Species Awareness Week, so it's good timing for this information. My name is Stacy Matrazo. I am the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation, and I will be um, presenting this information to you today. If you're not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. You can learn more about our work on our website at flawildflowers.org. Uh, our work is made possible through the sale and renewal of the state floor wildflower license plate. This is our old look that you see on the screen. Um, and a couple of years ago, we updated it to this lovely new look. Whether you have the old or new look, you are supporting our uh, programs and our mission, and we thank you. Since 2000, we have received more than $4 million in donations from the sale and renewal of that license plate. And that uh, money is, uh, in addition to donations and memberships, really helps um, allow us to do all the things that we are able to do, including bringing you programs like this. If you find our programs valuable, I encourage you to uh, become a member or make a donation or purchase the state wildflower license plate. And if you do have that license plate, you are also eligible for membership benefits with our organization. So you just need to let us know that you have it and we'll get you set up. So before we can talk about the impacts of invasive species, we need to define what it means to be native or invasive. A native plant is anything that originated in its location naturally without the intervention of human activity. So any species that's indigenous to a particular region, in this case, Florida, um, or a community where it occupies a specific habitat and fills a specific role. So we um, have, demarcated the 1500s generally as the line for um, determining a species nativity. If it was documented here when European settlers first began um, coming to Florida and um, documenting botanical records, then that is how we've deemed it native. An introduced species is any plant that is living outside of its natural range that has been intentionally or accidentally brought into the region or a habitat by humans. So that's uh, important. It's brought in by humans. Um, and sometimes they're referred to as exotic, but this term is being sunsetted by the botanical community. So introduced is really the, the term that, that we're using um, to address any species that was brought in, again, intentionally or accidentally by humans. And then finally, we have invasive species. So an invasive plant is an introduced species, but it also um, has caused or is likely to cause an alteration to an ecosystem uh, and disrupting the biodiversity um, or the native plant community by its um, presence. So what are the problems with invasive plants? How do they impact our natural areas? Generally, invasives um, have aggressive reproductive strategies. So they produce a lot of fruit or seed. Um, their seeds and fruit are readily dispersed either by wind, by animal fur, or um, having been eaten by animals and spread in their feces. But they also may spread vegetatively, which means uh, if they have underground runners that get out um, and reproduce that way, or even some of the plants that I'll be talking about can re-sprout from broken fragments. So they have, they have really incredible um, reproductive strategies that allow them to proliferate. They also tend to have a longer and earlier flowering period. So of course we know flowers give us seeds, um, which is what <laughs> allows these plants to reproduce. So if they're flowering earlier and longer, they're gonna have an advantage over some of our native plants. They also tend to have a fast growth rate and will outpace our natives and also um, allows them to quickly form colonies. They have a long lifespan. They have few natural predators, parasites or diseases. So no natural controls to keep their population in check. Um, some of them are also allelopathic, which means they emit a chemical that prevents other plants from growing around them. 
And invasive plants tend to be generalists. They're pioneer species. They're the first ones to come in in a disturbed area. They don't require um, specific conditions. So they thrive in you know, a variety of soil and, and light conditions. And that gives them an advantage as well. So with these strategies, uh, these invasive species are able to outcompete our natives for the resources that they need. Um, they decrease the natural diversity of our natural areas by again, forming those dense colonies and creating almost a monoculture of the invasive species, which doesn't allow our natives to, um, to come up in that area. It disrupts the integrity of our natural ecology. It alters our natural processes. So our invasives can have impacts on the hydrology of the landscape, um, of the fire cycle. Vines can weigh down our natives and even girdle some of our trees. So um, lots of different tactics and techniques that can disrupt the natural integrity of an ecosystem. And they reduce the availability of other resources, the food and shelter on which our native wildlife depend. Invasive species generally don't provide the resources needed by our native wildlife. And so when they're not allowing our native plants to thrive, then, then our wildlife are suffering as well. Invasive plants also have an economic cost. Um, estimates on how much Florida spends on managing invasive species varies depending on your source. The Nature Conservancy estimates that we here in Florida spend over $100 million a year just to manage invasive plants. And that's our tax dollars. Think of what that $100 million could do if we didn't have to fight these invasive species. And these economic costs pale in comparison to the ecological costs of the, of the invasives. Um, invasive species are the number two threat to global diversity, second only to habitat destruction. So it's a really important issue, something that we all should be aware of. It's why we have this week dedicated to uh, invasive species awareness so that we can really understand what our impacts are here at home and how we can uh, make changes to um, contribute to the betterment. So invasive species are monitored by the uh, Florida Invasive Species Council. And every two years or so, they put out an updated list of invasive species and designate them in two categories. Category one are the worst offenders. These are the plants that have been known to alter native plant communities by displacing natives, by changing that community plant community structure or the ecological function, by hybridizing with our natives, um, which means they actually can um, you know, mate with, so to speak. They, they, they um, mix the gene pool of our native and the invasive, and then that um, diminishes the potential success of our native species as well. Um, there are problems that require management on a large scale by municipal agencies. So category one, um, this is air potato, this is kudzu. These are the vines that, that ate the south, so to speak. Um, that have really just um, completely altered our native communities. And then we have category two, and these are plants that through monitoring we've seen have increased in abundancy or frequency and are expected to have a damaging ecological impact if we can't get them under control. So despite the fact that we have this list of known problematic species, most of them that I'll be talking about today can still be purchased. So even if we know or that we know that these are bad, that they cause major problems, we're still using a lot of these in our residential and commercial landscapes. And many people don't know when they go to a big box nursery that they're buying an invasive because there's no law requiring these plants to be labeled as such. So over the next few slides, I'm going to show you some category one and category two invasives that are commonly used in or found in our residential and commercial landscapes, and then offer some suitable native alternatives. Um, this is camphor tree. This was imported to Florida as an ornamental and um, to, to get its, its oil, camphor production. Um, and it's used primarily as a specimen tree in our landscapes and on roadsides. It's a nice, dense canopy tree 
um, has a lot of fruit. Remember, one of those strategies I mentioned is that these plants are prolific uh, seed or fruit producers, and they are very attractive to birds and other wildlife. Um, but these animals then take those seeds and disperse them readily, um, creating the, the, you'll see camphor trees in just about all of our environments or all of our ecosystems. Um, they also, this plant is also allelopathic, which I mentioned earlier, it, it emits a chemical around its base. So it prevents other plants from growing under or near it. The only thing that can really thrive under a camphor tree are camphor seedlings, and it produces a ton of those. So this tree will push out natives in our natural areas. Um, it is a pioneer species, so it will invade those open, disturbed areas, especially after um, a burn or after um, a mowing. And it's really hard to eradicate from the landscape once it's established. You can pull those seedlings up when you notice them. Um, you can mow them, and that does sometimes tend to kill the seedlings. But the stumps, even if you take that tree out, that stump will regenerate it. It will re-sprout. So if you do have to remove a camphor tree, um, you generally have to herbicide that stump to keep it from coming back. And just a note on herbicides, um, the foundation does not recommend the use of herbicides. However, that might be a last resort to manage certain invasive species. So I will mention some of the plants um, that do tend to need invasives, um, but I mean, excuse me, that needs that will need herbicides. But again, that's that's your last resort. And of course, all herbicides should be used in accordance with all label requirements and safety precautions. So and something you can use in place of a, of a camphor tree, um, Dahoon holly, which you see here in the picture is a really nice, um, can form a nice dense canopy. Um, both of our magnolias, Southern magnolia and Sweet Bay magnolia are nice alternatives. Um, Red Bay is another good one. Um, oak trees are also good replacements, sand live oak and live oak. Sand live oak and live oak are very similar, but sand live, live oak is a lot smaller. So if you don't have the room for a big branching um, you know, live oak tree, but you still want that aesthetic, you still want a, an oak, um, sand live oak is a really nice alternative and it's excellent habitat for um, our, much of our wildlife. Many of our baby birds um, are fed off of insects and caterpillars that are found primarily on our oaks. So oaks are just a great plant to have in your landscape if you have the space. And winged elm is another good alternative. These are all trees that provide um, a similar canopy. The magnolias are gonna have much bigger leaves than you get in your camphor, but it's still gonna provide a nice um, evergreen, dense, beautiful tree that you can use in place of that camphor tree. Uh, Lantana is one that um, you still find uh, advertised as a butterfly plant. It's readily available at many of our big box stores. Um, this was imported here um, for landscape use in the 18th century, and it does have these lovely cl colorful clusters of flowers. Um, pollinators do like this plant, but you will see this plant taking over natural areas throughout the state, especially those disturbed open areas um, pastures and citrus groves is nice dry sandy soils. That's where you tend to find this plant uh, thriving. It is toxic to some wildlife, particularly cattle. So it's not great that it comes up in those areas. And it can be toxic to humans too. The leaves, um, they have kind of a sandpaper feel. And if you crush it, it kind of smells unpleasant, a little um, urine-like. Um, so that's a good way to tell the difference between our natives, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, we do have a couple native lantanas. This species, however, Lantana strigochimara, hybridizes with our natives. So it's, you know, if you are trying to uh, replace them, it's good to get this one out before you bring a native in because you don't want to um, allow that hybridization to contribute or to, to uh, occur because this will compromise the gene pool of our native species. This is another one that's really hard to eradicate. Um, these, the stumps will re-sprout, so it's another one that if you can't get it all, you might need to um, you know, just paint it with a little herbicide. We do have uh, native lantanas, as I mentioned. This is Pineland lantana with a nice yellow flower. We also have wild sage or button sage, um, which has 
um, more of a whitish purplish flower. When you get that multicolor flower cluster, that's when you know you've got the, the invasive species. Our natives are fairly monochromatic in, in terms of the flower clusters. But these both do really well in, in nice dry sandy soils. They like full sun, just like uh, the invasive lantana does. You can also look at uh, beach sunflower, dune sunflower, it's also known as. And um, this is a great ground cover, especially if you're trying to fill in an area because this plant will spread if it's given the opportunity. Tropical sage is also a good alternative. Tropical sage is a good one for a lot of um, different conditions. It does great in shade and sun. It can handle some moisture, but it also does well in drier soils. Um, it's just a really easy to grow flower that produces a lot of seeds. So if you have one, you'll end up with a whole lot more. And our native porterweed is another good low growing ground cover. Um, I'll talk about the invasive porterweed a little bit later, um, but there is an invasive one. It looks very similar, but our native one is low growing and it's a great um, alternative for that lantana. This is Mexican petunia. Um, this, is, this was brought in in the 1940s as a landscape plant. It's another one that does incredibly well. It doesn't require a whole lot of attention, um, but it is an aggressive spreader. Uh, sometimes you will, you might hear landscapers or um, other um, landscape companies who or developers who want to use this plant say, "Oh, well, we've got a sterile variety." That is true. We have varieties that don't produce seed, but this plant spreads by underground runners. So even if you have a sterile variety you're still gonna have a plant that can get out of control. This is another one that also um, regenerates from sprouts. So if you're removing it and a piece breaks off, you're probably gonna have some more coming up. It's really hard to eradicate once it is established. Um, but it's, and one more thing just about the sterile variety, when we put these in our landscape, even if we have sterile, because there's a couple other species I'll mention that have sterile varieties available. So even if we're putting in the sterile and we think it's good because we're not you know, producing seed, the animals aren't gonna be able to eat it and disperse it, we're still showing people this aesthetic in our landscape. And somebody walking by or driving by your house who sees the plant and goes, oh, that's beautiful, I want that. They don't know that that's sterile or not. So there's no guarantee that they're going to go purchase a sterile variety. What we want to do is just eliminate these from the landscape if possible and not give other people ideas to put them in. You know, we're trying to do some work here and, and we don't want to encourage others to counter that by, by putting these in the landscape. Some good alternatives to this. Um, this is starry rosin weed. It gets about as tall. So the, the Mexican sunflower gets two to four feet depending on um, the variety that you have. There are some dwarf ones too. Um, starry rosin weed also gets um, a couple feet tall, has these beautiful yellow blooms. So a little different, but um, you know, has that nice um, same status, excuse me, same height. Um, Blue-eyed grass is one that does well in the same conditions, but it is a much lower growing. So this is a purple flower alternative if you're looking for, you know, to replace that purple from the Mexican petunia, but it is a much lower growing uh, wildflower. It only gets up to six to eight inches tall typically. I mentioned porterweed earlier. It's another good alternative. This one will fill in really nicely. Um, and again, it, it does stay pretty low, usually no more than 18 inches or so. Um, but has that nice purple flower as well. This is Stokes Aster, and it is pretty much, uh, you, if you're looking for that same aesthetic with the Mexican petunia, this one gets almost as tall, usually no more than two-ish feet, but it has these big, beautiful purple aster flowers. Um, so you can swap that out pretty easily and it'll still keep you or give you that same aesthetic. Same with spiderwort. Um, Tratoscantia, another good one. And all of these here are excellent for attracting pollinators. So when we have these native species in our landscape, we're actually providing the resources that pollinators need more, uh, more so than when we have the invasive species. So it's good to keep that in mind too when you're thinking about removing the invasives. Um, what are you trying to accomplish in your landscape? If you want to bring those pollinators in, bring in the native plants as well. 
This is uh, coral ardesia. Um, this is one of only a, a handful of the invasive species that are actually on the noxious weed list. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's no law governing the sale or use of invasive species. I should add to that that it, there is a law if the plant is on the noxious weed list. So this plant cannot be sold anywhere. However, it is everywhere. Um, it was imported from Japan as an ornamental around 1900, and it escaped cultivation. And it is really hard to eradicate as well. It's another one that produces a ton of seed or fruit that animals like to eat and disperse. Um, but it also spreads by underground rhizomes as well. So it's really hard to keep in check and it's hard to get rid of once it's established. Um, if you do have this in your landscape and you wanna get rid of it, you want to remove it before it fruits or be very careful if you're removing it while it's fruiting, you probably wanna put it in a bag as well so that once it goes to the dump or the landfill, those seeds are not able to get out and start producing new plants. We do have a native ardesia that you see here, marlberry. Uh, it's very similar in uh, the way that it looks. It has these lovely big um, uh, seed, or excuse me, flower heads. It produces a lot of good fruit that is um, desirable to birds and small wildlife. It looks very similar. It's nice and evergreen, dense foliage. The only difference is the leaves have entire margins. Just go back here, you can see the coral ardesia has these scalloped um, edges and our native one does not. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of difference except this one's not invasive. We also have um, our wild coffee plant, which is another good shrub, dense green foliage, lots of fruit production, um, flower production as well. Great for bees, butterflies, and um, birds and other wildlife. This is myrcene, which is again, dense green evergreen shrub. I'm just trying to give alternatives to, to give you that same aesthetic. So that invasive ardesia, evergreen, dense foliage, you know, this is gonna give you that same look without having all the bad side effects. Um, we have a couple hollies that work. This is um, Yalpin holly, Ilex vomitoria. Um, it's also got caffeine in it. You can make a tea out of it. So double bonus in your landscape. And um, we have several native blueberries too that will um, fill the bill as well and provide not only wild, food for wildlife, but food for you too. Uh, this is Suriname cherry. You see the fruit on the left, flowers on the right, another category one invasive species. And um, this was introduced from Brazil in the early 20th century. It's not actually a cherry, even though it's got that common name. This is commonly used in hedge plantings. Um, again, it's another dense evergreen foliage, um, easy to prune so you can turn it into whatever you'd like and, and make these nice dense um, buffers and screens in your landscape. Um, it doesn't have any pests. It's easy, you know, this is, this is why we choose these plants, right? Because they do so incredibly well, but they do too well and they get uh, out into our natural areas. This is another prolific fruit producer. Um, the seeds are readily dispersed by birds and mammals. Um, it is edible to humans as well. Um, the leaves have a eucalyptus-like scent when crushed. So you can kind of tell, it used to be in the eucalyptus family, but they moved it around a little bit, but um, because it has that eucalyptus-like scent, you can kind of tell what it is, even when it's not fruiting. But these will form dense thickets, they displace natives and prevent other plants from regenerating. And in order to get rid of this one, again, very hard once you have it in your landscape, you can hand pull those seedlings but the stumps will re-sprout. So it's another one that you probably will need to herbicide to get rid of. A good alternative is the Simpson stopper. This is its cousin. They both used to be in the same genus, Eugenia. Um, Simpson stopper has been moved to Mercianthes, but uh, still looks very similar. You can see the flowers look almost like the Suriname cherry. It produces that same nice red edible fruit. We can eat it as can our lovely wildlife. Um, 
And it has the same kind of uh, eucalyptus scented leaves. So it does have a nice fragrance, a subtle, but nice fragrance in the landscape. And this is one that you can prune easily. You can use it to form um, a hedge just like you would the Suriname cherry. If you're in south, uh, southern part of the state, Jamaican caper is a good alternative as well. Um, Jamaican caper has these just stunning flowers when it's in bloom, but it does have nice dense green foliage, um, good alternative for a screen, a buffer screen, or as an ornamental plant as well. And I mentioned myrcene before. Myrcene is another good um, alternative to um, Suriname cherry. Heavenly bamboo is another very commonly used plant in our commercial landscapes. Developers love to use this plant. Um, it does perform really well, but it is a fast growing invasive. It reproduces by seed, by root fragments, by suckers, by underground ry rhizomes. You name it, it can take it. Um, this is another one that you can buy sterile forms from, but what good is that if it's still gonna spread by underground rhizomes and suckers, et cetera? Produces a ton of fruit that um, birds and other wildlife will eat, but this plant will form very dense thickets and crowd out natives. You will see this invading um, our conservation areas and woodlands as well because it is a little bit shade tolerant too. When you are removing this, um, again, because it's such a heavy fruiter, you want to get it out before it starts fruiting or bag it if it is fruiting so that that fruit can't um, turn into more plants. Good alternatives for um, heavenly bamboo is pipe stem, which you see here, um, has absolutely beautiful clusters of um, these white kind of urn shaped or bell shaped flowers. This is a member of the um, heath or blueberry family. So very similar flower structure as, as you see in our blueberries. Um, hollies, I mentioned hollies before, gallberry, yelp and holly, both really good alternatives that provide a lot of fruit for wildlife to eat, as well as um, a lot of these tiny white flowers that are really attractive to bees, especially, and other pollinators too. Um, Virginia, uh, excuse me, sweet spire, um, Virginia willow, I think is another common name for it. Um, this is another good one, especially if you live um, in, a, in moisture soils, this one does really well. Um, it has lovely kind of um, bottle brush looking flowers, kind of a skinny bottle brush, um, but a really nice, very nice scent as well if you're looking to add a little bit of that to your landscape. And um, Rusty Lyonia, another member of the um, blueberry family or um, Heath or blueberry family. So again, clusters of white bell-shaped flowers, really attractive to pollinators and um, produces a lot of fruit too that um, are value, is valued by our wildlife. This one is uh, very popular. It's uh, climbing cassia, also known as Christmas cassia. This was imported um, as an ornamental plant in the 1900s. Um, it typically blooms in winter, but it, it does tend to bloom, you know, a little bit longer than that, maybe late fall through early spring. So um, it's one of those plants that is giving us uh, beauty when a lot of our other plants have gone dormant. It produces a ton of seeds and it may also sucker depending on the conditions. So it really um, is difficult to get rid of. It displaces our, our natives uh, in our tropical hammocks and our coastal strands. It's more of a um, coastal plant. And once it becomes established, it will clamber over trees and other plants and form a canopy um, kind of to shade out our natives. We do have some lovely native cassias um, or senna, excuse me, senna is the scientific name. We have three that are readily available that look very similar. So if you like the aesthetic of that Christmas or that climbing cassia, Look for our natives. This is privet senna. And then we have uh, Chapman's wild senna and Maryland wild senna. Very subtle differences. It's almost hard to tell them apart. So make sure you're purchasing um, the plants that you that you want and not getting the invasives by going to native nurseries. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. 
Another uh, commonly used um, plant or plant that you commonly see is Japanese honeysuckle. This is another one that is on that Florida noxious weed list. So you cannot purchase it. That's good, but it is everywhere. This was introduced uh, in the late 1800s for ornamental purposes. So we brought a lot of plants over here because they were beautiful and we wanted to have that aesthetic in our own landscapes without understanding that they would just get completely out of control. This has an incredible growth rate. Um, it outcompetes our natives. It sends out runners that will root and grow just about anywhere. It also twines around um, shrubs and trees so it can choke them out literally. And it just forms these dense thickets that are impenetrable by our other native species. Um, it does have very showy, fragrant flowers. Again, this is why we wanted to bring it over here, um, but it's really hard to get rid of. You, you can hand pull it, but you still have to dig out the roots. You have to remove all of the plant material to prevent it from re-sprouting. Um, and if you have a huge or big infestation, you can mow it to kind of get it a little bit under control, but then you'll probably have to herbicide that as well. We have um, a native, Lonicera, which is uh, the genus this is in. We have coral honeysuckle, um, very similar growing conditions. This has these really nice red tubular flowers that are attractive to um, butterflies, hummingbirds especially love those long tubular flowers. Um, and this is a good one because it doesn't require a lot once it's established. Um, it does like to have something to grow on. So it, with any vine, you probably want to give it a trellis or a fence or something so that it doesn't just kind of take over. Um, but it's very easy to get established and can fruit and flower throughout the year. This is cross vine, another nice big red flower. Um, this is a little bit hardier vine. Um, it does get some pretty dense stems or thick stems. So it needs some space. Uh, most of the vines can be aggressive, even when they are native, they, they can be aggressive. That is their nature to twine and vine their way up toward the canopy. Um, so we do want to keep those, uh, just keep that in mind if you are adding a vine to your landscape. But if you give it something to grow on, it, it tends to, um, you know, it's easier to control. Trumpet creeper uh, looks very similar to um, to cross vine. Their leaves are a little bit different, but the flowers are very similar. Nice, big, red, open, tubular flowers. And then we also have our native uh, Virginia creeper. And this one you find a lot in natural areas. It can be aggressive more so than the other vines I mentioned. So um, that is something to keep in mind if you are introducing this one. But it does produce a lot of fruits, very uh, important food source for a lot of our animals. This is an uh, asparagus fern, excuse me. Uh, this was imported from South Africa. It's not a true fern, even though it looks um, fern-like. It's close to, more closer related to lilies and to asparagus that we eat. Um, there are a couple other asparagus ferns that are readily available that are also not native. This one um, is um, invasive. It's often found um, as a ground cover in new developments and commercial landscapes. You also see it a lot in hanging baskets. Um, it does great in sun or shade, dry or moist, so it really doesn't matter what the conditions are, which is, again, why it's often used. It has bright green foliage, lots of uh, little red berries, but it is fast spreading. Um, it spreads by underground run runners or tubers. It's also dispersed by birds and rodents who eat those fruits. You see this one a lot um, along our roadsides and getting into our woodland areas, especially those that um, have been disturbed with fire or with mowing. It, this one likes to move into those disturbed areas. And it does form colonies that will displace our native species. Um, this one has little spines on the stem, so it does become a little bit difficult to manage if you're trying to remove it. You want to wear gloves. Um, they don't feel good when they poke you in your skin. 
It will die back um, if a freeze comes through, but the roots are going to survive. It's only going to kill that above ground plant. So the roots are going to survive and you're going to get a whole new plant. Best to just eliminate it completely. Um, <clears throat> you might need to use an herbicide with this one too, if you can't um, you know, get the whole thing out. But if you are removing it, um, again, because this is a prolific uh, fruiter or seeder, you want to get it before it starts to fruit or bag it so that it doesn't have an opportunity to regenerate. Good alternatives for asparagus fern. Uh, this is beech creeper. This is a really lovely plant, a um, little underutilized in our landscapes, but definitely one that you can find at your native nurseries. The flowers are tiny. It's a little misleading in the photo, but they are pretty small, but very intricate and um, just, just a lovely plant. Evergreen foliage, um, really interesting aesthetic, even when it's not in bloom. Uh, I mentioned dune sunflower earlier, always a good option when you uh, want to just kind of cover an area with a, a plant. This is seaside heliotrope. Um, this one you find growing, uh, you know, along our dunes and in our dry sandy soils. Um, it's a full sun loving plant as our um, beach creeper and dune sunflower. So good for an area. If you're getting rid of that asparagus fern and it's got nice, sunny, well-drained soils, um, this is a really good option for that. We have a few St. John's warts um, as well that are available. Um, this one is Atlantic St. John's wort and it does well in those same conditions. And if you're looking for maybe a little bit more of a shrubby or something that'll get a little bit bigger, Walter's viburnum is a good option. Um, you can cut this plant back so you can keep it smaller. There's even a dwarf um, variety that's available. Um, but with this one, you get a lot of um, bee attractants because of those lovely white flowers. And then Kunti is good. Now Kunti doesn't produce a flower. This is a cycad, um, so, but it does remain just nice dense evergreen foliage throughout the year. It is a larval host for the Atala butterfly. So it does have um, an ecological use or a natural use, um, but it's a really nice one. Very low maintenance, slow growing. So keep that in mind. You're gonna purchase them in a size that's smaller than what it's gonna get to. It might take a little while, but once it does, they fill in really nicely and um, often will give you a nice um, cone of seeds too, so you can um, propagate some more. This is snake plant. This is a category two invasive. Um, this is very popular in our commercial landscapes. Uh, a lot of our new developments like to use this. You can buy this plant um, very easily in our big box stores. It was brought in as an ornamental and also as a fiber plant. Um, it's known as bowstring hemp. It's another common name for it. And it is used in its native land in the Southern tropics and in Africa um, to make bowstrings and rope and other fibers. So um, we brought it over here for that purpose as well as to introduce it to our landscape, um, but it has gotten out of control. It can tolerate moist and dry conditions. It uh, spreads rhizomatously and resprouts from any piece left behind. So again, another one that's hard to eradicate, comes out of the ground pretty easily, but it often leaves a piece behind and you'll start seeing them come up pretty quickly. It can form a dense uh, ground cover if you let it, um, which will again exclude those native plants and uh, you know, prevent them from revegetating. Um, this one, so because this spreads so easily um, from pieces, it's another good one to bag, even though you don't really see those, those fruits, it doesn't have a lot of fruits that are um, going to be problematic, but because, you know, taking it to the landfill or wherever it's going, you don't want those pieces to re-sprout, so it's good to bag it. Um, it does not respond to herbicides. The leaves have a waxy coating on them. Um, they're succulent leaves. And so those chemicals are just not going to penetrate it. You have to remove it by hand. Good alternatives to this, sea uh, oxide daisy um, gets just about as tall. The um, snake plant can get a couple feet tall and so does the sea oxide daisy, but 
It has these lovely yellow aster flowers that are very um, attractive to butterflies and bees and other pollinators. Of course, dune sunflower, that's a favorite, as you can tell, um, it's very easy to grow. So I just like to remind people that it's a good alternative if you're looking for something easy that isn't too particular. Um, but again, think about where these plants are naturally. Dune sunflower is found in our dune ecosystem. So it's gonna do best in that same kind of environment. There's nice well-drained soils, um, full sun, excuse me. Um, Christmas berry is another one that we find in our coastal areas. So um, again, loves those well-drained soils, a little bit of moisture is fine, nice full sun, and you'll get these lovely purple flowers. Um, it produces a lot of fruit, these nice white, or excuse me, red berries when it's fruiting um, that are very attractive to birds and other wildlife. So it's a good one to add if you have the right conditions. Um, grasses are another alternative. When you think about snake plant and that kind of habit that it exists in, it's almost like big thick leaves of grass. And so you can consider replacing it with a grass to kind of have that same um, low growing uh, evergreen look. This is muley grass, which in the fall just puts on this stunning display of purple kind of wispy flower heads but the grass is evergreen. Uh, it looks great even when it's not flowering uh, and it's a bunch grass, so it can be divided. And um, you know, as it starts to fill in, you can actually separate those bunches and you can have them uh, in other parts of your landscape. I mentioned Simpson Stopper, another good one that uh, works in those same requirements or the same conditions that the snake plant does. Uh, wild coffee again is and uh, kunti. Kunti is another one that you know again that snake plant has that kind of just gives you that wall of green and that's what you're going to get from this kunti as well. Uh, this is the category two invasive creeping oxeye. We still see this so much in our landscapes. Um, it's still used in um, a lot of commercial and new residential landscapes. This was introduced as a landscape ground cover back in, um, I think in the late, or excuse me, early 1900s. This plant is ranked as one of the 100 world's worst weeds. That's not just here in Florida, that's everywhere. This plant is fast growing, it's mat forming, it spreads by underground runners and re-sprouts by fragments. So it is just incredibly prolific. It has invaded our agricultural areas, our roadsides. Um, just you see it along stream edges because it does like moist soils as well. Um, but it can tolerate dry to wet, sun to shade, drought, freezing, mowing. It can even respond to burning. So it's really um, just <laughs> kind of an amazing plant, but not one that is good for our native, um, native plants. Um, you have to hand pull this plant to remove it, but you have to make sure you get those roots and rhizomes because they will regenerate. And this is another one that you want to bag when you're removing it because any piece that, that is left out to the elements is going to create a whole new plant. Um, dune sunflower, not to keep beating this one, but this is the perfect alternative because it looks almost the same. Low growing, outspreading, green foliage, yellow daisy flower, perfect uh, replacement for that Wedelia, that creeping oxide. Um, twin flower is another good one. This is a low growing, um, spreading native wildflower with purple flowers. Um, this is a larval host plant for several different butterflies as well. Um, one that you can mow and it will come back and produce even more flowers does great in sun to shade, moist to fairly dry conditions. Frog fruit too, very similar, nice evergreen mat forming ground cover that is a larval host for a couple different butterflies, um, can be mowed, comes back nicely. It flowers all year round. Um, the twin flower too, I should mention, has a really long bloom period too. So. Um, providing resources for a good amount of time. And sunshine mimosa. This one does like a little bit drier, but uh, in full sun, but again, it spreads by underground rhizomes. 
Um, it's pretty fast growing too and will um, do really nicely in a disturbed area. So another great alternative to um, creeping oxi. And the mimosa you can mow as well and it'll come back. This is Chinese wisteria. It was imported in the 19th century for ornamental purposes. It does have a long bloom period, um, but it has really thick stems that twine around trees and shrubs and can actually girdle or kill them. Um, it can form really dense canopies. It climbs up into the treetops and will just alter the available light um, down you know, to the forest floor. So it prevents a lot of things from coming up even when it's not in that same space. The stems and the leaves are toxic to humans and pets. So another reason, probably don't wanna have that in your landscape. Um, if you wanna get rid of this, you need to cut it down to the ground and, and paint it with herbicide because it does regenerate from um, the rooted stolen. So this is another one to put in a bag as well when you're getting rid of it. The seeds are, are heavy, so they're not really transported by birds very much, but they do float. And that's another way that this plant can spread. Um, is by getting into our waterways and floating into other areas and then um, sprouting. We do have a native wisteria that looks almost the same. It has a little bit shorter flower clusters. So the flowers look very similar, but just a little bit shorter clusters. The seed pods um, are not hairy, whereas the invasive one is. It blooms April through June, so spring into summer. And it's a larval host for um, many butterflies and moths. So a good alternative, if you want wisteria, you've got to have wisteria, we have a native wisteria that will work in its place. And of course, I mentioned trumpet creeper earlier. Um, again, red flowers are attractive to butterflies and hummingbirds. And we have Carolina jessamine. This one um, has nice clusters of yellow flowers. This is another fairly aggressive vine though. Um, and I did mention that most of our vines are aggressive. Um, this one can get up into the treetops pretty easily, um, but you can keep it in check just by paying attention to it, cutting it back when it needs to be. Um, otherwise it's just an absolutely lovely vine to have. Um, grasses are, these, these are, this is fountain grass, there are a few grasses that are commonly used, again, in new developments, commercial landscapes, you see these a lot. Um, this is fountain grass. Um, it needs very little maintenance, but it offers nothing ecologically except its potential spread where it's not wanted. So um, this was brought in um, for landscape purposes in the late 1800s, and it has this nice, fine, textured foliage, these lovely um, plumes of flowers. It does well in full sun to moist to dry, well-drained soils. It's drought tolerant, fast growing. It readily reseeds. All those flower spikes that you're looking at are full of seeds. They get picked up by the wind and water and carried away. And then there we have new plants sprouting. Um, you can hand pull this one, dig out those large clumps before it goes to seed or make sure you're bagging it um, if it is seeding so that those seeds don't get out there. A good alternative is muley grass. Very similar um, grass, the, the blades are those thin needle-like evergreen um, blades. So it looks very similar uh, when not in bloom. And when in bloom too, it, I think this one's even prettier because the, the flower heads are wispier and bigger. They're not just those single, um, spikes that you saw on the fountain grass. We have a few blue stem grasses that are excellent replacements to, uh, this is split beard, um, but there are several others that are available at your native nurseries. Um, the, you don't see the base in this photo, but they have this nice kind of bluish chalky color to them. So it's a really interesting color to add to your landscape as well. And then we have a couple of uh, love grasses. This is purple love grass. Um, there's uh, Elliot's lovegrass as well, which has a white flower head, but still just very attractive, even when not flowering, because they're evergreen and because they have, you know, an interesting, um, 
interesting leaves or, or needles, well, blades, excuse me, <laughs> blades. Um, and then there's Fakahatchee grass. And this is good if you have big space to fill because this grass gets big. There is a dwarf variety that is sometimes available at native nurseries. So it does keep it down a little bit, but this will get nice and big and spread out. It's just got gorgeous, gorgeous blades. And then it has lovely flower shoots that'll come up um, that have kind of a maroon color to them that are just absolutely stunning. But this, this one in particular, the Fakahatchee grass is um, best if you have the room for it. I made that mistake. I put three of them in in the front of my landscape and did not uh, consider how big they were going to get. So I'm dealing with that now. But you always want to think about how big the plant's going to get or potentially going to get when you choose to add it to your landscape. Um, I did mention before um, that we have an invasive and a native porter weed. Um, the invasive species that you see here, nettle leaf porter weed, is tall and erect. This is how you tell the difference. This one grows up tall. Our native is low growing and spreads out. So if you see a porter weed that has these purple flowers, but it's growing upright, you know that's probably the invasive one. I say probably because they hybridize. I mentioned that earlier, that's not good. The hybridization of our natives with our invasive species compromises the gene pool of our natives and makes them more susceptible to disease and other issues. So we don't wanna have these in, the, in our landscape. Um, this was brought in as an ornamental. Um, it does really well. You see it a lot in butterfly gardens because it's the one that you can buy at a lot of your big box stores. And it is a, it is a pollinator plant, but we have a native that does a much better job and doesn't have those invasive tendencies. And there it is, our blue porter weed. Um, also, an alternative to the invasive is starry rosin weed. I mentioned that one earlier. Um, Blue-eyed grass, which is a lower growing plant. So again, if you're trying to replace the, the aesthetic, then you want to consider that. And these lower growing plants might not be what you're looking for. But that rosin weed can get up pretty tall. Um, Stokes aster, again, can also do that. Um, and uh, spider wart, a little bit lower growing, but um, is still um, a good alternative. So these are just some of the common invasives that, um, and some of the native alternatives. There's so many more of both out there, unfortunately. Um, a lot more invasive species, but way more native alternatives that are going to do great. Uh, depending on your landscape conditions, there's always going to be a native alternative for you. Um, you can do your part. The number one thing you can do is avoid planting invasive species. Know what you're buying before you buy it. Just because it says it's a pollinator plant or because it's evergreen or easy to grow doesn't mean that it's not going to cause problems in our natural areas. So make sure that you um, know what you're buying before you buy it. As I said before, there are no laws preventing the sale or use of the invasive plants unless they're on that noxious weed list. So they're often readily available. You can even buy them on Etsy and Amazon and these sites. I, I was so surprised to see that you can buy plants. Um, you know, it, there's interstate travel and commerce with these plants, but, um, you know, Remember that even though they look nice and they may serve a purpose, they're not necessarily providing the resources that our native plants can provide. And they're likely contributing to an ecological problem. And you're also contributing to others using them by showing them how they are in your landscape. And then if they're in your landscape, if you have invasive species present, consider removing them and replacing them with appropriate native species. Once invasives, um, have been removed, you do wanna make sure that you're surveying that area pretty frequently to make sure you're getting anything um, re-sprouting or um, you know, recurring because a lot of these plants, they're a lot more prolific than you, than you realize. Um, there's a lot of information out there to learn more about invasive species. The Florida Invasive Species Council is where you're gonna find those lists. So they're the ones that update the list every couple of years. It's a comprehensive list of all of the plants that have been deemed 
um, invasive, whether it's category one or category two. So if you look at that and compare it to what you're considering to buy, you'll be able to determine really easily if you're getting something that's invasive. Um, US IFAS also has great um, uh, information on invasives, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife. Check out these websites um, for more information. And definitely visit our website. Um, we have, uh, excuse me, a short article on invasive alternatives that um, shows some of the plants I talked about today and some of the alternatives that you can find. Um, certainly check out your Native Plant Society. Um, they have great resources on native plants as well. And if you are in South Florida, um, the Institute for Regional Conservation has an excellent um, database of native species, again, to find those alternatives in your, um, that are gonna work for your landscape. And most importantly, buy native plants, buy native seeds. To find a native nursery in your area, visit plantrealflorida.org. This is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. You can go on their website and look at a map that shows you all of the native nurseries in a particular area. You can also search by plant if you're looking for a particular plant. Um, and if you have a Native Plant Society chapter in your area, they often do native plant sales. So you know, keep an eye out for them and um, um, check out what they're doing. If you are interested in buying seeds, the Florida Wildflower Cooperative does sell uh, Florida native seeds and you can check out their website at floridawildflowers.com. Um, thank you all. I know I'm running a little bit long. I probably have time for a question or two, but please um, check out our website for more information. Follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. This webinar will be on uh, YouTube, a recording of it within 24 to 48 hours, as well as on our website. So um, please look for that too and, and share it with others. Our next webinar is uh, Wednesday, March 30th, and that will be on aquatic and wetland butterfly gardening. Uh, and that's presented by Sean Patton of Stocking Savvy, an aquatic biologist and um, ecological consultant. So definitely check that out. Um, registration is now open on our website. So um, you can sign up now. Um, I do have time for just a couple questions. So let me see what um, we've got here. Um, and my scroller's not working. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, let's see. So Diane asked if we can petition our governmental representatives to create a bill to stop the sale of all cat one and cat two invasive plants on the list. Um, uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know, but I would start with, um, with the Florida Invasive Species Council and find out what they are doing to, to work toward that. Um, and this is a really hard industry to, to get into, so I, I don't know how effective it would be, but um, I suppose if a lot of people started making a sink about it, it's possible that something could be done. Um, or, you know, I don't know what's involved in getting something from invasive to noxious weed list, um, but that might be a starting point as well. Um, the, the Invasive Species Partnership is another good um, organization to get involved with. They have local chapters that um, throughout the state that have regular meetings and keep you updated on, on things that are happening with regard to invasive species management. So that's a good place to start too, if you're interested in finding out you know, more about what you can do beyond your own landscape. Um, let's see, another question. Um, I'm in a garden club and was wondering if we are allowed to use this program for our club. Absolutely, uh, you're welcome to share the recording. Um, again, it'll be on YouTube or on our um, website. So please feel free to uh, share that. Um, Kalea is say, asking if Staca tarfeta jamaicans is native to the Caribbean, is it also native to the Americas? Yes, Staca tarfeta Jamaican says is our native porter weed. So it is native to Florida, but it does have a, a broader reach than just the United States. Um, typically when it has that Jamaican um, species name, it is because it it's from Jamaica or from the islands or from the Caribbean. 
um, but it is native to, to us. That is our native species. Um, let's see, we have one more question here. Um, herbicide to kill weeds, will it damage large oak trees? Um, that's Jeanette Hathaway asking that question. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that necessarily. It depends on how you're applying the herbicide. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't really advocate the use of it, especially not in a general sense. Um, if you're just looking for weed management as opposed to invasive management, um, there are other alternatives that I would recommend um, because you don't want those herbicides to get into your soil and, and yeah, to cause damage to other plants. Um, if you're talking about invasive species removal, you can be very targeted with your use of herbicides. Um, you know, when I talk about removing a Suriname cherry shrub or something like that, you're cutting it down to its stump and you're literally painting that herbicide on. So if you're not broadcast spraying it, it doesn't, it's not going to be problematic to any other species. Um, and certainly broadcast spraying is not something that we would recommend because you're going to get, it's going to drift onto other plants and cause a lot more problems. So, um, you know, look at the instructions on the herbicide if you are using it, but definitely you want to target it to that specific species that you're trying to, to kill. We are um, over three o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and um, end the webinar. But if you have additional questions, feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org, and we'd be happy to um, respond to you. Again, look for this um, on YouTube or on our website in the next 24 to 48 hours, and um, um, join us uh, at the end of the month for our aquatic butterfly webinar. Thanks for joining us. Bye.